Hello and welcome back to my channel. I'm Bob the Booker and uh, this is my little wrap up of the books that I have been reading over the lovely month of July. Uh, it has been a bit of a tough reading month for me. I think, um, I mean I realise I've said that a bit recently, but I think basically my brain has been all kinds of everywhere, partly because of heat, partly because I've just been a bit stressed and tired from work, partly because it's that point in the year where I'm just worn out and uh, yeah. But we're about to go into book a season. Well, we are kind of in book a season now. And so I kind of need to remember how to, you know, do a fair bit of reading, hopefully, to, to kind of get through that. Anyway, uh, but I thought I'd go through some of the books I've been reading this month. Um, and apologies, I'm realising increasingly how wrinkled my t-shirt is. Wonderful. I'm doing really well. Anyway, um, so the first book I finished this uh, this month was an audiobook um, called The Interest by Michael Taylor. Now, this is a book um, that details the um, the role of the British in um, in slavery, um, and particularly um, the the kind of campaign to abolish slavery, and how it's not quite as clear cut as it always seems. So. Um, a lot of the narrative in the UK, especially around uh, the abolition of um, of slavery, was or the slave trade rather was was that um, often the um, it's it sort of sort of written as in yeah 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 slavery was bad but then look at us good British people we outlawed it and we outlawed it earlier than other people aren't we amazing and what this book does um that's really great I think is really unpick some of those arguments to really sort of focus in on the details of actually many many people resisted it um and many people only really changed their minds when it looked like there was a financial incentive to do so and even then uh the kind of after effects of slavery are still things that we need to consider, particularly around reparations, particularly around sort of many other topics about what that does sort of psychologically to a group of people when you've basically enslaved them and their ancestors for many hundreds of years and then expect them to just sort of be able to slot straight into society um, and be perfectly well adjusted and happy and all of that without kind of hereditary wealth or, or anything else like that. So this book does a really interesting job of taking apart some of those arguments. And I think it's such an overdue book in some ways, um, because, I mean, at least for me, I've, I've not read too, too much about this, but I'm definitely thinking of when I was a kid in school and the conversation was very, very much, um, you know, look at all these good people who chose to abolish slavery, yay. <laughs> and it's a bit strange because that sort of, slavery sort of happening for a couple hundred years or more and then them being like look at the nice white people who stopped it it's like i kind of feel like there are probably some other people involved um so yeah anyway uh really really interesting book and i think does a really good job of, of kind of challenging some of those narratives um in quite an interesting way Next, I read a few books by Iris Murdoch, um, and I've mentioned them in more detail in my Iris Murdoch video, so I won't go into a lot of detail here. Um, but first was Bruno's Dream, um, which is a story all about this this man, Bruno, kind of with this sort of family around him who are all a bit... I mean, it's just they're so wonderfully disconnected and balmy and absurd and... It's kind of brilliant, um, but at the heart of it, you've kind of got this man who's really trying to work out what is happening he's kind of having these sort of strange dreams or sort of ideas around spiders quite a lot um and it's all a bit sort of absurd, absurd and and kind of almost philosophical in kind of classic iris murdoch fashion um but yeah really interesting nonetheless um and one that i've just finished um is the book and the brotherhood uh by iris murdoch as well uh which sort of equally follows um this sort of group of friends who are um uh, kind of trying to sort of destroy this sort of piece of work that's been written when they're a bit younger and now sort of seems to follow them through their lives. But in the meantime, their lives are kind of these complicated, bizarre things um, that are all kind of happening. So yeah, lots and lots happening uh, in a very sort of strange little world for them all. Um, and I also read around the same time, The Nice and the Good, uh, which also by Iris Murdoch, which um, follows a similar set of ideas um, in some ways to some of her other books, um, but sort of fo focuses on these characters sort of after having observed, well, after being connected to a murder slash suicide. Um, it's not sort of known at first, 
and sort of watching this cast of characters who are all sort of sleeping with each other and all have these bizarre kind of connections to each other all try to second guess each other because each of them thinks pretty much that they're going to be the next person um, to be blamed and so they're all trying to kind of carefully avoid um, kind of being sort of found out or being kind of seen to be the person who's responsible um, all while kind of dodging it in their, in their own way. So really interesting, uh, really interesting book. I go into more detail about it in the Iris Murdoch video um, as I do for this, this next book as well, which is um, Iris, the memoir of, of Iris Murdoch by John Bailey, who was her former partner, her husband. And um, he, so it, this book is sort of written in the time of um, Iris Murdoch's sort of final years when she is sort of starting to really struggle with Alzheimer's. And it's such a gorgeous portrayal of not only the tragedy and, and sort of difficulties of um, of Alzheimer's and of memory loss and sort of end of life, but also this really touching portrayal of who Iris, you know, was as a person throughout her life, this sort of energetic, vivacious, curious, um, strong-willed, spirited character um, with all of these incredible ideas and sort of writing all of these novels and then watching how in her final years with, when sort of Alzheimer's is getting kind of stronger, how she's sort of losing grip, but actually how it's a really touching portrayal of their, their marriage because he talks about how he knows this woman so well, he adores her and that love just sort of seeps out of every single word of this book. He, you can tell he just absolutely adored Iris and um, it, it sort of has this really touching moment towards the end where he says about how um, almost the expectation is that this that you know this is the end of their marriage you know because Iris doesn't remember much anymore and she's sort of fading in some ways you know her memory's going and he sees it as almost the opposite like this is the test of marriage this is why they got married it can't always be the good times indeed this sort of final moment together is the most married thing that could happen um because it's a bond that's so deep that he's there with her and it's almost kind of unconditional um beautifully beautifully written book i was just absolutely floored by how gorgeous some of the descriptions are of this and it also has some really nice moments with um Iris and sort of other authors, which I always find really interesting about the idea of what it looks like when authors get together, particularly sort of big authors at the time. Um, so Iris Murdoch with, for example, Eva Bowen. No, is that right? Yes. Um, who was a sort of uh, 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 writer around the time. And just these kind of, these sort of little interactions. It's really quite beautiful. So yeah, gorgeous, gorgeous little book. Next up, and I'm going to sort of group these books together because unintentionally I read quite a few books that were about Italy this month um, for very different reasons was I reading these. Uh, I don't know why I phrased that sentence that way, but let's go with it. Um, so the first up was Family Lexicon by Natali uh, Natalia Ginsberg. Um, and so she, um, this is a sort of auto-fiction, semi-fiction kind of thing. And so it's a really interesting thing because um, this book so this is in translation from the original Italian. The original Italian is apparently full of this, I mean, as the title might suggest, a very idiomatic, very specific kind of um, Italian um, where the translator apparently had a bit of a nightmare with translating certain phrases because some of them are so Italian and so specific to a region that to translate them into English means almost finding a similar regional accent or, or dialect that would kind of be mirrored in that language. Um, I didn't always get on with this book. Um, it was for uh, my local bookshop's um, uh, book club, and they uh, they kind of chose it and thought such an interesting choice. Um, so essentially, it's a really interesting book that kind of goes through this sort of family's history, and particularly this family in sort of some key historical moments for Italy. So obviously the last sort of 50, 60 years or so, Italy's had quite an interesting history politically and historically, and just interesting history historically. There we go. Really throwing out some good tautology there. Um, but um, I think what's um, so interesting about it is just how it how it kind of plays with those accents. You've got this sort of, it's told all through this family in almost a very cold style. It's sort of a family talking to each other. There, there's a sort of quite horrible sort of overbearing father figure um, but you've got kind of all these sort of siblings all kind of squabbling with each other and all these sort of people again sort of sleeping with each other and kind of complicated sort of family and, and friend relationships going on. Um, but yeah, I, I kind of sometimes got a little bit lost in this book, um, partly because 
there were more than three characters and as I've already found that doesn't seem to work for me uh, but also just because I think there are so many complicated complicated interweaving bits and also um, because of that kind of cold dry tone sometimes it feels like you're so sort of detached from the book but there are some really interesting bits nonetheless um, I think but I think it's, I also get the feeling this is a book that's maybe not fully my thing but I know that some people absolutely love I mean Rachel Cusk is on the back talking about how amazing it is as is Maggie Nelson as is Hermione Lee so you know it, it obviously has worked for some people uh, the next book sort of around Italy that I read this month again completely unintentionally um, was Still Life by Sarah Winman um, so this book got a lot of love and hype um, and I know a lot of people are also wanting to see this on the book a long list and having read it now I, I kind of almost sort of do wish it had kind of been given that that little bit of um, love but um, Still Life is uh, a sort of sweeping story of, of this sort of these two people who meet um, quite early on um, in a sort of very specific scenario and then over time you know they, they basically lose touch with each other and they pass within meters of each other often you know there's a scene where one of them's on a train leaving a city um, and, the other, and the other person's watching that train leaving and sort of trying to run after them because they think it might be that person who they passed on the bridge who may well be um, the relevant person but a really gorgeous book the, the prose is so lovely um her attention to detail around voice is so good i mean i listened to the audiobook and it was sarah winman reading all of the voices which was firstly incredible she's got a great reading voice for this kind of book anyway and i love authors reading their own stories um but what was especially great is that there were these kind of characters with very kind of south london estuary english essex kind of accents um other characters who had sort of very specific kind of italian influenced english um really gorgeous and interesting book in so so many ways um yeah i i sort of occasionally got again a bit lost in the story but i think that is again me being slow with kind of things and i think i just got a little bit lost in some of the detail overall though i think just a gorgeous gorgeous read and next up are you wondering when another book of book would appear? Uh, Shirley Hazard with The Bay of Noon. Um, so this was shortlisted for the 1970 Lost Man Booker Prize. Um, and I'll do a separate video about that whole shortlist. But essentially, long story short, um, the rules changed at one point between Booker Prizes from 1969 to 1970, which meant that whereas previous, the previous year, 1969, was about all books that had kind of come up to that period, the next one was going to be books published in the coming year. So there were loads of books that were published in that middle bit that kind of got lost, that basically weren't eligible for the prize before and weren't eligible for the prize after. And that became the Lost Man Booker Prize, which sort of a few years ago was sort of dug back up and they thought, okay, actually what books would have been eligible um, let's give them a sort of second showing and let's choose a winner from that. Um, and although Shirley Hazard's The Bay of Noon wasn't the winner, um, this is just a really interesting and gorgeous book focused on Naples. Um, so this is interesting, these three Italian books on kind of different parts of the country, which is nice. And this book kind of is around sort of, um, sort of wartime Italy. Um, you've got these sort of really gorgeous sweeping descriptions of place and, you know, Shirley Hazard, um, it's sort of I found really interesting is sort of, She's an Australian author um, just writing about Italy in a way that just feels like she's lived there forever. It's just sort of so gorgeous, the, the intricate details that she picks up on on every sort of street corner or in the way that someone says something. And these really lovely descriptions of sort of these like sort of love triangles or complicated relationships. Um, and it's just so beautiful. I love this sort of style of... Um, there's something very much about the kind of the quote unquote English novel. And I say this obviously Shirley Hazard being Australian, but um, there's a very sort of specific type of novel, I feel, from the sort of 1960s, 1970s, these sort of slim novels written by women um, that deal with the kind of complexities of relationships in a really nuanced and interesting way, whilst also capturing something about the national sort of zeitgeist um, or something around, um, you know, the complete change in society, um, because obviously it's sort of a time of sort of post-war where not only was women's independence growing, but also sort of internationally, lots of ex-empire countries were sort of becoming independent. And in this in this book, we have a lot of talk around Somalia, um, which was sort of part of the Italian empire. And um, 
so, so this book reminds me a lot of people like Penelope Lively, uh, Penelope Fitzgerald, um, and sort of other really gorgeous books from that time. Um, sort of Bernice Rubens, this really clever kind of character study um, of a book, but that also deals with these really big sweeping historical moments. And I just, th I just think it's really beautiful. And um, I'm really, really glad that I read that. Next up, I read Hotel World by Ali Smith. Another book, a book, ooh. Uh, but this is also partly because I'm gearing up for it being Ali Smith's birthday in August, and I've got a video coming out about her. Um, and Hotel World is one of the only ones of hers I hadn't read up until this point, and I've only got a couple more, I think, that I, I want to read, uh, that I've got left to read, rather, um, and do want to read as well. I love her. But um, Hotel World, I have to admit, didn't fully work for me. Um, so the, the, the concept, I think, is really interesting in, in many ways. Um, it's focused around a hotel, as you would maybe expect by the title. Uh, but there is a sort of, there's someone who dies fairly early on, and we kind of learn about the kind of interconnectedness of all these stories. And there's something really clever about that, because, you know, obviously hotels are, the, I, I sort of, you know, like the, the novel um, Hotel du Lac by... Um, by Anita Bruckner. Um, hotels are such interesting places for writing, I find, because you've got people who are in the story of that area really temporarily, um, you know, often only for a day or two. Um, they are from different places, so you've kind of got this natural meeting of people who have completely different roles and understandings and, and sort of things happening. Um, you've also got a lot of kind of other intricate details that can kind of go around uh, on around um you know these intense friendships or relationships that start and then end just as quickly um or kind of observing characters and i think it's really interesting hotel world does a lot of that but i think this is quite early um ali smith and something i found i mean it's not necessarily for every one of her early books necessarily ali smith is a very experimental writer likes kind of doing a lot of playful interesting things what for me didn't necessarily work about Hotel World was sometimes it felt like the playfulness went so far this way that we kind of lost why that was connected or important in the first place. And I, I think, you know, some of my favourite Ali Smith books, so books like The Accidental, which I think was pretty much the next book after this, um, and um, the, the Seasonal Quartet, um, I think, and it had to be both, I think what they do really interestingly is that take that playfulness and that experimentation and use it sort of in service of a really good story um whereas for me hotel world at one point i found that i wasn't really caring too much about the story and sometimes that's okay obviously right that, that can be okay and maybe it didn't help that this was an audiobook for me as well um but i think the thing i found a bit tricky about this book in places was that at one point there's this whole sort of scenario of this sort of old woman talking about um I don't even think she's meant to be old, but the audiobook made her sound really old, um, of her sort of talking about sucking pennies. And I was sort of sat there waiting for a bus, just being like, what on earth am I listening to? And it, it, like, I can sort of see if maybe I'd been in a slightly different frame of mind, I might have just been like, this is brilliant and I love it. But I think I just sort of was a bit like, I messaged Kier, uh, Kieran over at Katie Books, because um, I know that he read this and did not necessarily get on with it. And I basically sort of messaged like, what? on earth am I listening to? <laughs> like, tell me, like, does this, have I misunderstood or is she just talking about sucking coins? Um, and uh, especially because it was with an audiobook, it's sort of done in this very sort of jolly style of like, ha ha ha, and I'm sucking these pennies, uh, which is a terrible impersonation of what the audiobook sounded like. The audiobook actress did a very good job. Um, however, I think I was at that point, this was only a, kind of a couple of hours in, and I was like, and how how was this connected? Who is she again? Uh, so I don't know. I didn't necessarily get on with it. Um, but I think it's still an interesting thing for me of, you know, the Ali Smith I have come to know and love. Um, it didn't work for me, but then a lot of her other books blew me out of the water. So I'm willing to maybe overlook one or two here or there. Next up, um, I got this through a subscription to Galley Beggar Press, and this is from an author who I have maybe spoken just, just a little bit about before, and that's Lucy Elman, the author of Duck's New Report, but her um, set of essays called Things Are Against Us. Um, and what was really funny, I don't think I've got it here. Um, I need to find it. But there is, um, there, th like, there's a, a bookmark that came with it that just says, let's complain. And I was sort of just reading another book with it and realised sort of being on the train or, or whatever out in public, just sort of this giant 
uh, bookmark just saying let's complain. Well, you know, their previous book, Insignificance, there was another bookmark that just said insignificance. Um, and so that, but let's complain is a very good summary in many ways of this essay collection. So it is Lucy Ellman um, sort of basically having some kind of fun rants about a few things in society. So um, mostly around um, sort of men and women. Um, so a lot around, for example, pay gaps and um, unequal treatment and particularly unequal treatment in the age of people like Trump. Um, and just sort of, it goes into a lot of, of interesting sort of discussions on that. It gets very ranty at times. Most, uh, most of the time, I think just hilariously so. She just keeps gunning for a point. And you're like, we kind of get it, Lucy, but just keep going because this is hilarious. <laughs> and she just keeps digging and she's like, and another thing. <laughs> and you're like, <laughs> you know, that kind of when you if you've ever sort of been out with a friend who's gotten just a little bit drunk and Larry and is sort of like telling you about like a, you know, they've been really quiet about an ex for a while and then suddenly they like break their silence and they're like and let me tell you another thing about Frank uh, I don't know why I'm doing that accent but uh, <laughs> like this is very this book is very much that and so it is like having your angry drunk friend unleash and I love it <laughs> because it's so it's so cleverly done because I, I in some ways that description doesn't do it justice because this book is very clever and very witty and is very considered but at the same time you do kind of get the sense that Lucy Ellman at the end of it sort of takes a deep breath and is like I'm wicked okay cool uh next essay and you know some really clever ones and um, I was um I make some really intelligent points as well um throughout so not to kind of undermine it um I will say occasionally I sort of was like there is a bit of sometimes nuance missing in some of the rants where, you know, she, she, she talks, for example, about, you know, um, uh, ranting about how basically nobody should ever be flying because of the effect on the environment. And whereas, yes, flying is terrible for the environment, it does miss out the whole thing that there are some people who have zero choice, not because of business meetings necessarily, but like their family live halfway around the across the world um, or they have migrated, you know, like, yeah, but that all aside, I think um, it's a really fun, uh, a really fun collection. And I, I went to the launch party online um, held by Gallybagger Press and they did. It was just really fun. They um, they had a reading. Uh, they had a few kind of question and answer bits. Lucy Elman is just always really fun to listen to. She's just a really interesting woman. Um, and I, I love her thoughts on things. Uh, and obviously love Dr. Newburyport, so I'm, I'm, I'm a fan. Um, but also she, I think, does some really, uh, the, 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 the woman who does the audiobook for Dr. Newburyport um, also did a little reading of one of the essays from this, which was really fun and kind of captured the, the brilliantly angry energy of this book, but in such a glorious, brilliant, affirming way. And uh, yeah, I thought it was a really great, a really great experience. Next up, and you'll notice a few of these are audiobooks because apparently my eyes just did not, they were not playing ball. My brain and eyes were not working together for any reading really this month. Um, yeah, so the next book I listened to uh, was Colton Whitehead's The Underground Railroad. Um, and it's something, a book I've been meaning to read for a while, a book that I also sort of thought I would start reading or listening to in advance um, of his upcoming book. Um, partly because I thought it might be uh, long listed for the booker and also because I, uh, the Harlem Shuffle, that is, and uh, also because I've got it on, um, I've got it as an advanced copy and need to read it soon. So I kind of thought, you know, I've read The Nickel Boys, I'll read The Underground Railroad and I'll get a kind of sense for, for this. And I thought this, this book is so gorgeous. It, it kind of charts this sort of, you know, the, the, the movement of the Underground Railroad at the time and it's just written in this really glorious, powerful prose. It's so, um, some of my issues with the, I, you know, overall really enjoyed the Nickel Boys, but there was something about the writing style I didn't quite click with and I couldn't really work out what it was. Um, the Underground Railroad, I think for me, did kind of caught some of those bits that I didn't necessarily find as much with um, the Nickel Boys. And I just thought it, it, it handled it so brilliantly. There are just this kind of, there's this cast of characters who you just really root for and really care about um and there are just these glorious vivid descriptions of their worlds um it's really quite endearing and quite powerful so um yeah i'm really excited now to read the harlem shuffle the harlem shuffle and um see a bit more but i'm now kind of getting i'm finally kind of getting the colton whitehead thing because i think i read the nickel boys and everyone was like so 
in love with it and it won the Pulitzer and I couldn't quite understand what was happening. And then now with the Underground Railroad, I think I'm getting it. Um, so there we go. Um, and then next, a book that's very different, uh, which is Dear Reader by Kathy Retzenbrink. And this is a book that uh, I've heard a few people love, um, including Eric Carl Anderson over at Lonesome Reader. And it's interesting, I think I kind of needed someone to prompt me into reading this book, um, or again, listening to it as an audio book, because I, I was kind of uncomfortable, not uncomfortable, it's not the right word, but like, I, I think I falsely assumed that this would be, I'm sometimes a bit dubious, basically, of non-fiction books that talk about the love of something, because sometimes it can feel, even though it's, you know, about reading, which is clearly something I enjoy, um, I was worried that it would be a bit kind of, that sometimes it kind of does that thing of imagining that, that readers or whatever other person, you know, other interests you have, almost creates a separate identity that makes it sound like you're either better than other people who don't do that or that you're somehow like super cool and unique and kooky and quirky like oh my god nobody gets you and, which is unfair but i've definitely seen that where like you know books kind of talk about you being an artist and every every time the word art or artist is written it's with a capital a and you sort of it's like, no, you as an artist are a beautiful and special creative being and nobody has ever created like you before. And I was really nervous it was a bit of that. But I think hearing that Eric really enjoyed it, I was like, OK, I'm going to give this a, a shout. And uh, I'm really glad I did. This book um, charts Kathy's life um, as she um, sort of documents, you know, the first sort of books that she sort of discovered or loved and the reasons why. And she does this really interesting thing kind of at the end of each sort of chapter or section where she kind of loops together, um, you know, brings together all of those sorts of books that kind of follow a similar thing. So she might, for example, talk about um, letters. And so she might start the, the sort of chapter or section talking about a book that's kind of written in epistolary form, um, sort of through letters. Um, and she might kind of talk about then like kind of weave that into her sort of personal life and then at the end she'll sort of give a bit of a reading list of oh here are you know 10 other books written in that kind of style that i really enjoyed and that meant a lot to me and she'll kind of give a bit of a backstory about why it's connected and i really loved that this book i think managed to avoid so many potential pitfalls it never really felt snobbish um, it never really felt like she was saying she was better than you. It didn't really feel like she had created readers as this sort of mystical being. It was very accessible, this idea that anyone can be a reader and, you know, that reading is a really great thing. Um, she spoke about her career as being, you know, being a bookseller and someone who whose job it was to go out and talk about books and, and sell books and, and really kind of engage with books um, in an exciting way. She did a, a programme working in a prison, um, encouraging people to read. and. She manages to do all of this in a really short space of time in this book um, and give great recommendations. And there's a list online that you can sort of find of all of her books, all the books mentioned that I really want to read through because all of them sound fascinating. And um, I just think this, is, this book is really quite special and quite beautiful. It feels very much like a little like warm hug of a Christmas gift, um, you know, where you give it to someone, maybe as a stocking filler, maybe as a sort of standalone gift. And it's just sort of something that you curl up with and really enjoy. So I'm, yeah. I really, really enjoyed this. I thought this was really special. Next up uh, was a piece of non-fiction that I listened to again. You can see I was definitely doing a lot of audiobooks this month. Um, I think I only really read about four or five books physically. Um, it's, just, it's, it's been one of those months, you know. Um, and the next book that I read was David Attenborough's A Life on Our Planet. And um, love me some nature, love me some David Attenborough. And this book is a sort of manifesto in some ways for change on, on um, protecting the planet. And I think what this book does really quite well is sort of foreground a lot of the discussion um, each time with kind of actually how much carbon is in, you know, in 1960, when, uh, 19 whatever, when he was a child, how much carbon was in the atmosphere? What, what did the planet look like? How much rainforest coverage was there, for example? And sort of details how that's been lost. And it's a real sense of loss as you go through the book. Um, it's done so cleverly and so powerfully. Um, you know, I, I'd already be inclined to kind of love this because it's David Attenborough and because it's about nature. But I think this book is really quite clever and really quite... I think it, it kind of makes the, the solid head argument about, um, about climate change, but also the heart argument. Um, and it's sort of fascinating kind of hearing essentially the story of David Attenborough's life alongside the sort of parallel with the, the story of nature. Um, so I think it does some really incredible things and it's just really lovely. And it's all read by him as the audiobook and, you know, his voice, literally, I could hear him read anything and I'd be very, very happy. 
Um, although maybe maybe not some like a, a grisly like murder thriller thing that might maybe that's not quite made for his voice or maybe that'd be great I don't know I can't tell if that's so jarring that it'd be terrible or so jarring that it'd be kind of I I sort of ironically brilliant who knows anyway brilliant book um then next I read uh this lovely little book here and as a part of a buddy 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 read I'm get, getting weirdly northern on certain words don't really know why what's happening there I'm on a buddy read with uh Sean the book maniac and this, this is The Promise by Damon Galgett which has recently been oh there is my light falling um which has been the light does not like this okay uh uh, this book was uh, long listed for the Booker Prize this year recently and um, this book is all about, I don't know why I'm putting it down, like I'm finished with it, um, this book is all about a white farming family in South Africa and there, the promise, the sort of central promise of the book kind of is related to two things. Firstly, an individual promise um, of the house, the, the sort of farmhouse being passed on to a maid um, as a black maid um, for the family and so there's that kind of dynamic already set up sort of in terms of this racial dynamic and sort of power imbalance of sort of like a family employing this black woman to raise these kids and then the promises we find out for a large part of the book is just non-existent but there's also this national picture kind of tied into it of the national promise of South Africa which is you know this promise that was given to everybody of this idea that South Africa was going to be this sort of rainbow nation, this sort of free land where, you know, um, there'd be racial harmony and everybody would be equal and all of these things, which clearly did not happen. And, you know, South Africa, I mean, I don't know too much about the politics there, but there's still a large amount of disparity. Um, and so this book does a really interesting thing of marrying together this sort of personal angle um, of this family's tale and the national picture of uh, South Africa. And what is really clever as well about how that's threaded together is that this whole book is sort of split into four kind of chapters or parts and those chapters are named after people who die. And so we begin this book with the chapter Ma and the first lines make it really clear that this mother has died and the son is sort of wandering around pretending that it hasn't happened and just sort of cannot deal with this news. But then we get to the second part and it's called Pa, and we learn that the father has died. And then it starts creating this thing where when you flick to the next part and you see the name of the, of the chapter, you think, ah, this person's gonna die, let's find out how now. And it's really cleverly done. Um, it, it just sort of, because you sort of have this lingering sense of dread as you go into it, where you're not quite sure how it's gonna happen. Um, I will also say, like, this book, just, my goodness, what a writer. Uh, Damon Galgut, just on a sentence, sentence by sentence level, these sentences are incredible. There were pages that I would just sort of take pictures of and be like, I need to come back to this. There's an absolutely incredible um, page that talks about um, race in South Africa um, and how this sort of young woman had not yet, I'm going to paraphrase, had not yet um, been trodden down by the rules of the society. She had not quite learned what it was yet. She was still this sort of innocent young girl and she hadn't had that innocence stamped out of her. And it's a really violent, um, violently written passage. Um, but I think that really talks, you know, speaks to the violence that is racism and is sort of racial disparity in, in a country like South Africa um, and everywhere. But like, yeah, really, really brilliantly done. Um, I'm so glad this book was long listed for the booker because I, I mean, I loved his other book, In a Strange Room, uh, which I will defend to my dying breath. I adore that book. Uh, and I think it's great to see just another really solid book from, from this author um, and so, so interesting. And the final two books I read this month um, are The High House by Jesse Greengrass. Uh, this book is all about environmental collapse essentially and this high house um, is sort of a part of this sort of village or town that is essentially safe and there's this really kind of creeping sense throughout the book of knowing that environmental collapse is coming or at least predicting that it's coming and in some ways being powerless but also this kind of absolute terror of what they're going to do to make sure that they're safe how are they going to kind of edge out 
the kind of competition of these other families around them? How are they going to make sure they've got medical supplies and food and, and everything they need? How are they going to make sure that this high house is protected? And so it sort of turns from this sort of house that's sort of high in this in this village or town into almost a fortress of sort of, you know, that's the, the vantage point. That's the, this, the, the safe place in all of this. Um, so I just thought this was really brilliantly written, really short book actually, but really cleverly written, some absolutely gorgeous bits of um, of dialogue and of, and of description. Um, and it's so interesting to see a book about environmental collapse in this way that doesn't kind of feel the need almost to make it kind of a post-apocalyptic world where it almost feels unreal. I think what's really effective about this book is in many ways it feels very real. It, it's almost uncomfortable how real it feels because th this book almost is trying to tell you almost that it could be five years in advance. And that's scary and also quite real probably. Um, but yeah, really, really interesting book um, and well worth checking out. Um, and that takes us to the final book uh, that I read this month, which is Truman Capote's In Cold Blood. Um, I realise a lot of these books are kind of jumping about all, uh, all over everywhere. This is also because sometimes I will put a book on, I'll reserve a book, online sort of two months in advance and then they'll come at different moments and so my kind of whim from two months ago will kind of catch up with me. This is partly because I have borrowed um, uh, In Cold Blood, the physical book from a friend and have not yet given it back to them and me too soon. So I just thought I'd listen to the audiobook instead because <laughs> book of reading is coming. Um, and, uh, but I, I'm finding this really interesting. It's such, um, such an interesting book where it's kind of a Sort of, sort of real life story. It kind of is, but it's kind of been somewhat fictionalised and there are sort of details that have sort of been clouded over, but essentially there's sort of a murder and sort of a crime scene sort of all around this. And it's this kind of noir sort of uh, book with really gorgeous detailed descriptions. Again, I'm finding it really difficult to really track down all the, the millions of characters in it, but um, I think it's, it does some really interesting things nonetheless. Um, it's a really pretty um, book in part, really grim. Um, I also can't help but laugh because there's a character called Dick and literally, uh, you know, I'm apparently a 13 year old in my sense of humour at times. <laughs> so they just keep on referring to Dick and how much they love Dick and it's, it's a lot. Uh, but um, it's, none, that silliness aside, you know, this is sort of a bit of a, a classic in some ways. And so it's, it's fun to be able to finally check it out, even though it's kind of in a genre that is not something I typically would read. Yes. Um, but those have been all the books that I read over July. Uh, I would love to hear from some of the books that you're reading, um, what have, what's kind of stood out for you, and especially if you've read any of the books that I'm talking about here. Um, apologies that it's probably going to get fairly bookerish from here on out, but then I also feel like that's kind of in my channel name, so <laughs> I'll try to pepper in some other things that are non-booker, mostly for my own sanity. Uh, but I, uh, I hope you enjoy it either way, Have um, and that you've had a wonderful reading month. Um, and that you continue to, especially as we go into the summer, where lots of people hopefully will have a good amount of time off to really just sit and enjoy books. Uh, I've been Bob the Booker, um, and yeah, have a wonderful time. Bye-bye.